Not only was the Rasulullah himself, but his Sahaba as well. In a well known hadith, the Rasulullah says, Ashabi can you join? For the Ayyim, Akhtadaytum, Ikhtadaytum. That my Sahaba, my companions, are like stars. Whichever one of them you follow, you will be rightly guided. Stars, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Quran, and we think of personal experience, you know that the stars are there to guide us. Allah says, وَعَلَمَاتٍ وَبِنْ نَجْمِ هُمْ يَحْتَدُونَ That through different landmarks and signs and through the stars, they find their way. Okay, and the only way you can, you can use a star for guidance is when you know the stars, when you study the sky. When you know, okay, that's the North Star, that's that star, and you can be able to use that as a direction. But a person who does not know anything about stars, the stars are not left up to them. If any one of us today would look outside and, and we were told to find a direction using the stars, we couldn't do so because we don't know stars. But at the time of Rasulullah, and even until this day, Many people use the stars for guidance. When all else fails, your maps, your GPS, the stars are there to guide you all the time. And living in the city, you really can't see the stars because there's light up there and there's always something of light which, which kind of doesn't allow us to see the stars. But when you're out in the desert, for example, in the countryside, and you're driving at nighttime, all you can see is the stars. It's all dark outside, and the only thing you can see, the only light, is the light of the stars. Then you begin to realize that, oh subhanAllah, that's that star, that's that star. And this was in the I guess, in the last night, and this one is brighter now. And you begin to have this realization of the stars. Again, this only happened after looking at it several times, kind of studying it. And this is the example of Rasulullah and Sahaba. They are there for guidance. But the only way we can derive guidance from them is by studying them, by getting to know who they were. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يَتَّبِعُونَ اللَّهَ Let's say, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you say you love Allah, say to the people, if you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِ then follow me. If you follow the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will love you. So, love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, love of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lies in following. As the poet says, إِنَّ الْمُحِبَّ لِمَنْ يُحِبُّ قُطِيرُ 
that a lover follows and is obedient to the person he or she loves. So when it comes to Rasulullah his lifestyle, his sunnah, it's important for us that we follow that and, and, and apply those examples to our lives and our situations. And if you look into the seerah, you will find examples after examples of how to live your life. You will come across a situation where you said that SubhanAllah, if I had read this earlier, I would have not known how to deal with that situation. And you will continue to follow upon these examples after examples of how Rasulullah dealt with the situation. And although those occurrences happened many, many years ago, as Rasulullah his example will last for the day of judgment, we will continue to find relevance in the hadith. Many, many ulama and scholars have written commentaries and, and derived lessons from the seerah. And that has not stopped. They continue to write. Books are still being published. New books are being written in different languages. And every single scholar has a different aspect. He sheds light on a different aspect of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life. So being Rabi al Awwal, and in a month where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is very commonly remembered for this month, we don't want to just leave the gathering by hearing his name and just listen to stories, and get happy, you know, enjoy the enjoy the lecture, and go home and, and go back to normal. We heard a change. We all realize that we have some kind of deficiency in our lives, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our relationship with our families, our parents, spouses, and everyone out there. There is some type of change that we need. When it came to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen him and had made him the per most perfect example. If you take any aspect of his life, or whether it came to his physical appearance, his strength, the way he was, his attitude, his habits, everything was absolutely impeccable. A perfect person. The actors and actresses in Hollywood, they're commonly referred to as stars. And as these individuals are constantly portrayed in films and different scenarios, we look up to them. Adults and children alike look up to these people. And these in reality are people who are empty inside. What we spoke about in Jummah today was about that outward fixation, that the outward, outward must, be, must be perfect. And that's what they are. And we fall into the same trap, that same cycle. They are not stars. These people are empty inside. And we see at, at times that the, the disarray in their lives and their problems come up to, society, to, to the surface. And we see that no, they're not so perfect. The true stars, as Rasulullah mentioned, are the Sahaba and he himself. Every aspect of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi life, like I said, you can derive an example from it. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu, Anas ibn Malik, a very young Sahabi, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina, Anas radiallahu anhu was roughly 9 to 10 years old. Okay, and he says that, he would later say that, I, I spent 10 years with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, any angle you can look at the Prophet of life, you will see how he dealt with people, how he dealt with children, how he dealt with students. When someone made a mistake, how the Prophet of corrected that mistake? Was he ever harsh? Did he use strong words? And then when you think about the Prophet of you always have this figure that, you know, this person was really strict, you know, always praying, you know, always reading Quran, crying out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, teaching, teaching, teaching. But when you really see the life of Rasulullah, I guarantee you every single person, every, every brother and sister, every child, every adult can relate to the Prophet. The Sahaba would say sometimes that the Prophet was so normal amongst us. We would talk about Akhirah and he would join us in the talk of the Akhirah. We would talk about the Quran and he would talk about the Quran. 
We will talk about the dunya. Talk about this animal, farming, this, that, whatever it was at that time in that society. The Prophet ﷺ would join in the conversation. You know, a lot of kids talk about cars. Those are something that Rasulullah he would engage in that conversation. As long as nothing was impermissible which was being discussed. Someone could even say something against the Prophet ﷺ, insult him, say harsh words against him, you know, even physically hurt him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he wouldn't take revenge, he would forgive you. We know that many times there's so many incidents. One time Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we always would comment here that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have much wealth. Okay, and the reason for that was he wasn't poor out of, you know, he had no choice. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's poverty was by choice. And one of the reasons behind that is that he's a Prophet of Allah. And he is an example for everyone. And if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a high standard of life, not everyone after him would have that same standard of life. There are many, many poor Muslims nowadays. For these people, how would they implement the Sunnah of Rasulullah Wasallam? How he ate, what he ate, how he dressed. The Prophet Wasallam chose the simplest of garments, ate the simplest of foods. And this gives every single person out there an example, a true example to follow. The Prophet, when, the, when the Sahaba describe Rasulullah Wasallam, they say, Sahlul Khuluq. He was easy going. No, he wasn't uptight. Some people when they get status and fame, they become different people. And we have friends sometimes that, that they become famous or something happens and they just ignore you. The Prophet said it wasn't like that. Remember who he was? He was the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was their teacher. He was their general. He was the king. He was everything. But the riwayah, the narration say that if there was a slave girl or a slave boy in Medina, even they would not be afraid to approach Rasulullah Who is this? He is literally the king of Medina, and Arabia practically. And the riwayah say that a slave boy or girl could take his hand and take him around the streets of Medina that I need to talk to you. He wouldn't say, oh, go away from him, you know, security take him away. And, and that was the situation up until the ayah of Allah will come in nas which means Allah will protect him from the people. Up until the ayah was revealed, the Prophet was in constant threat. Someone could hurt him, assassinate, kill, or do something to him. So the Sahaba would voluntarily come and, and, and guard him. They would come and protect his, wherever his tent was, wherever his house was, wherever he was, they would stay around. One or two of them, three, four of them. And Against the Sahaba, their, their, their love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi one day Rasulullah was in his house or in his tent, I can't remember the actual incident. But he heard some noise outside. And he said, Who's there? So I said, Sa'ad. Sa'ad Abu Waqqas. How can I help you? Ya Rasulullah, I know, I just thought I should just come and just guard where you're, where you're staying tonight. And Rasulullah said, What did this do? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi was able to make dua for him. He made a dua for him. The Sahaba were looking for ways to get the dua of Rasulullah Sallallahu Always looking for ways of dua. Sayyidina bin Abbas radiya Allah was a young child. He comes over, his aunt was Maimuna radiya Allah anha. Rasulullah was also his cousin. And he asked Rasulullah, I want to spend the night with you. Did you just want to hang out? Maybe he wanted to hang out. But we learned later on that he was there to see how Rasulullah Sallallahu spent his night. He said, I was there in another room and Rasulullah Sallallahu woke after midnight. And I was there when he woke up. I was waiting for the moment. I went and got some water for him. Again, water was not, we didn't have taps. He didn't have taps, full of water in his house. So he wanted to be there for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Young boy, 12, 13 years old maybe. He was 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Yes, Rasulullah, I'll get some water for you. And he made, he poured the water for him so he could do a little and the Prophet made him dua for him. Allahumma alimu ta'awil, there are many different du'as, different narrations say. Oh Allah, faqimu fi deen, give him the, the knowledge of his deen. Ya Allah, give him the ability to interpret the Qur'an. And we know that it is primarily because of his du'a, and everything he learns later on, is that he is considered the greatest mufassir, 
the, the greatest commentator, the foremost authority when it comes to Tafsir. Whenever you look into any book of Tafsir, you will see his name being repeated, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas. He was a young Sahabi, one of the youngest Sahaba in Medina. Sahab ibn Bukhaz comes, how can I help you? I'm here to protect you, Ya Rasulullah, just, just stand guard for the night. Rasul makes God from him. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi was saying, he was, up until this ayah was revealed, people would, would stay around him as security. But nothing very formal like a whole entourage, and you have a checkpoint, something like that. I think it's really distracting. <laughs> Sorry. So, like I was saying, that he was really easy going. Anyone can speak, approach him, talk to him. The slave world will talk. And what? The Sahaba, the way I say that, they would walk around Medina. He's a busy man. They would walk around the streets, you know, so I have to talk to this. Hey, do you like this shirt? Go to the marketplace. This is what we'll go. Anyone can approach him. And sometimes people will come and be very harsh to him. So one of his guys saw something say there, and a man came in, and the Prophet like I was saying, his poverty was by choice. So people would send gifts, he would have so many things coming to him. He had land in, outside of Medina where he would have, uh, he had dates and things like that, would, that would come in, all the harvest would come to him. But instead of keeping it for himself, he always gave it on Sadaqah. Although the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, some wealth came to him and he gave it up. That's all his own wealth. Some were sent by other leaders around Arabia and from foreign lands. It was all for him. But he never kept anything for himself. They would send sacks full of gold coins. And Rasulullah, when the wealth would come to him, he would say to his wives and his family that I am not going to come home until all of this wealth is distributed. I don't want anything to do with it. How could I benefit from this money? And we have poor Sahaba, poor companions. There are poor people in the community. They need more than I do. So Rasulullah at times this wealth was distributed right away. And at one particular occasion, Rasulullah came in at night and asked Abu Barira, Abu Barira, have you distributed all the wealth? He also, you know, I tried a lot. There's some left over. He said, I'm not coming home. So he spent the night in the masjid. So when the money would run out, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would then say that if he needed something for his wealth, some kind of family, food or something like that. Or someone came to him, Ya yeah, Rasulullah, yeah, you are a leader. I need money. I have very difficult circumstances. He would say, okay, go to so and so, a seller in the marketplace, buy whatever you want and tell him I will pay him. What kind of generosity is this? When we say Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kana asqal nas, he was the most generous of people. That's what we're talking about. That he gives everything away, whatever he has. When everything is exhausted and done, he takes debt upon himself. For what? For himself? For other people. And this happened till his death. Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha says that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very few belongings. And out of those things, one of the things he left as inheritance was, a, was armor he had, a set of armor, or a shield. And in that, was it with him at that time? He had given it to a Jewish merchant in Medina, who was holding on to it as, as security. Also, he didn't have any money, he said, okay, here, give me this much amount of wheat or barley or food or whatever type of ration, and here, take my armor, hold on to it. And when I make the money, I'll pay you. Till his death, Rasul Sallallahu was in this situation. So one of these occasions, a man who had, who Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam owed, he owed him some money. And the Rewaiyah say that there were still maybe 10 days left before he had to pay up. But this man came in very angry. And he was, he was, he was in the wrong for coming and approaching Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the time. And he came to the gathering, and you can imagine the love of Sahaba for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're sitting and learning. And you can imagine someone comes in here and, and, and disrupts the gathering and starts talking loudly and screaming and yelling. You don't get mad. All the guys who lift the weights will go and charge the guy right away. So Rasulullah is sitting there and they're learning and, and this man comes in. Where is Muhammad? And he starts yelling and screaming and cursing Rasulullah The Sahaba are enraged. 
They are absolutely furious. Like, who do you think you are? And when you, look, when you think of who's in that gathering, there are Sahaba who are there to learn, there are Sahaba like Umar radiallahu anh, Sahaba like Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anh, very, very strong Sahaba. An incident of Umar radiallahu anh, which you may have like, even read or heard, of his strength, that it was well known in, 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 in Mecca. And if you read his seal, that he was very well, well built. Very strong. So when he heard, this is, this is in Mecca, I, I'm going to get lost in the story here. So I need mean, everyone to be awake. And I know you all have dinner. And if I had to say in scheduling this, I would have said that, have the food after, please. But hey, so I need everyone to stay awake. So if I do get lost in this whole story, and we're going back and forth from Mecca to Medina, and from the first year to the last year, after his death, Allah, I said, I'm going to need your help to find my way back to Allah. So this is back in Mecca now. So we're talking about Medina. Now we're going to go back like maybe 15, 20 years. Okay. This is when Umar the Allah became Muslim. Umar the Allah, he can't take it. Muhammad Sallallahu is there. He's not Muslim yet. And he's this guy, Muhammad. He's in Mecca. He's a noble person. But he's spreading this deed. People are following him. Families are being kind of split apart. You know, this causing a lot of mischief according to them. Just as nowadays they say everything's mischief. You know, the deen is mischief, it's evil, they're spreading hate and all this stuff. It happened that time. It happened throughout history, and it'll continue to happen. Okay, that's why we have examples. Always look back. If you look at the seerah right now, if you go home literally right now and look at the seerah, you will find that history is repeating itself right now before us. That's why it's important to read it to know how to react. I'm getting lost again. Well, a couple years ago, it was unfortunate that some people had made some character towards the cartoons of the Sussalah, which is unfortunate. And as a Muslim, it's really hurtful that someone would draw a funny picture of someone you love dearly. And to some people, it didn't affect them. But if someone drew a funny picture and put in a magazine of your father or mother, how would you feel? You wouldn't care who the person was. You know, freedom of speech or whatever it is, you wouldn't care. If the person is in, in, in your high school or wherever you are, you probably will beat the person up. Okay, we're not justifying any actions, but this is how your feelings are. So at that time, natural Muslims around the world are enraged, they're furious, they're upset. And a lot of times, because we have disconnected ourselves from the seerah of Rasulullah we don't know how to react. We get angry, and unfortunately, on CNN and all these news channels, they always show that the loudest and the most, the, the craziest people. You know, last year, again in, in Egypt, unfortunate situation, they had riots and all this was going on. And whenever you looked at the headlines or, or any videos, they would always show the loudest people. You know, people are peacefully protesting. But then you have one or two guys who are just screaming and like, just going crazy. And the camera focuses on them. And everyone thinks that Muslims are crazy. Okay, and they have these comedians who take that and they laugh and laugh at Muslims. And they have Muslims who participate in those comedy shows and they get a laugh at them. Just like, are they just joking? They're making fun of you. So, Rasulullah at that time, people called him things. What was, what was the Prophet's name? What was his name? What do we call him? Muhammad. What's his name? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Not a trick question. What's his name, everyone? <coughs> Muhammad. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Does anyone know what Muhammad means? I see you looking down now that I'm not sure what that means. Muhammad means the praise one. Muhammad means the praise. He is called the praise one because Allah subhanahu wa praises him several times in the Quran. Okay, and everything about him is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His name is Ahmed also. Mahmoud, all these things are part of his name. Okay, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has Aminah name, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a similar amount of names. All actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran or the Hadith, he is described as with different names. Okay, Taha is called one of his names. Okay. So and the name of Muhammad was something unheard of in Arabia at that time. When his name was proposed at the time of his birth, this was a name that no one had ever kept his name before. It was just something new. Okay, and you can tell that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that his grandfather named Muhammad. So, now, whenever the disbelievers in Mecca, the polytheists, are talking against Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're saying, oh, Muhammad said this, Muhammad said that. And then the name naturally has a positive connotation to it. The praise one said this, the praise one said that. The praise one said this, this and that, this and that. The praise one has done this today. So they didn't take that. So some of the foolish people in that society, 
decided to distort his name. And what did they call him? Did they know? Muhammad. They began, began calling him Mudammam. Mudammam, on the same scale as Muhammad. Mudammam is the opposite of Muhammad. Mudammam means the humiliated one. It means the opposite. Okay, so they would just say this that, oh, Mudammam is here. Mudammam is here. Mudammam is here. Not all of them, but some of them would say Mudammam, Mudammam, Mudammam. Okay, trying to incite anger and, and you know, hate amongst Muslims and, you know, try to anger with Muslims. Like so. How does Muslims like so react to that? The Sahaba said, Oh, you can call him and start fighting in person. The Rasulullah himself gave us the best example. And if we could look at these examples, we would not have a reaction in any situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. We hear many evil things of Islam, hijab, the niqab, the imam, the thawb, any sunnah, also the beard. Okay? When you walk from the airport outside now and you're growing beard, and if you have like a small beard, people will look at your beard. Okay, it's, it's natural. Okay, so Rasul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, La tuhlawna fi amwalikum wa anfusikum, wa la tasma'unna min al-ladhina utu al-kitab al-qablikum, wa min al-ladhina ashradu adhan kathira. Allah says very clearly, this is a long time ago, the Quran was revealed, that you will be tested, O Muslims. Those of you who say you're Muslims, alhamdulillah, are Muslims. That you will be tested. Allah will test us. You will be tested. The amwalikum, in regards to your wealth. Something, something happened, you lost your wealth in an accident, you got sued, something happened, whatever. You will be tested when it comes to your wealth. Wa anfusikum, you will be tested in regards to your personal selves. In your family, someone passes away, gets into an accident, something happens, someone dies, you die, you get hurt. Okay, Allah, these are all tests for us, all tests. Wa la tasma'unna min al kitab. Allah says, you shall indeed you shall, I mean, I can't even translate it in English because لتسمعن, لتسمعن is a word which means سمع means hear. Lam is for emphasis at the beginning of the word and then at the end is for emphasis together. So it's two articles of emphasis that you will surely, surely hear. Which means that you're going to hear this for sure. Okay, no doubt about it, it's going to happen. You will surely hear from the disbelievers and from the polytheists much, much other hurtful things. You're going to hear things from them. Okay? What does the end of the ayah say? Who's the Hamad? Who can finish the ayah? I know some of the I don't want to put people out now. Let's go to the Amalek and Fusikum. Let us know that the Lady of the Kitab will come to you and the Lady of the Kitira. Up until now, one of our one of our shaykhs, Shaykh Hadith Muhammad al Muayyiz, Hafizullah. He is a, a great teacher of mine. He's at our school, and uh, he has like the highest book you can ever teach in, in our Alam program, which is Sahih al Bukhari. Sahih al Bukhari is the last book we study in the Alam program, and a teacher and a, and a shaykh of extremely high caliber experience is, is given that book to teach. So he's not a Hafiz. And every time through Sahih Bukhari, if you read Sahih Bukhari, you know, Bukhari Rahimahullah Ta'ala has patches of ayah in certain places. He has a portion of the ayah. And then he'd ask him, he wasn't a hamdul, but he knew the ayah. And he'd say, and our alhamdulillah, when we were stepping, there were seven of us, or eight of us. And I think all seven or eight of us were from the father in our class. And he would say that, okay, what's after that? You know, and alhamdulillah, whenever he said, what's after this, we'd be able to finish it off. Okay, the hamdul, the normal, the hamdul. When you're asked to finish it, to complete an ayah, you can finish it off. It's just kind of flowing in your mind, and you know, if I ask you, Qul Allah Rabbi Naz, Malik Ibn Naz, Qul Allah Naz, Come on, okay? So you can, you can finish it off, okay? But sometimes it would happen that he would remember an ayah during the lecture, and he would say, no, no, what's the ayah before that? And this is when every single person in our class would get stuck like, and you continue to flow, read a whole page after that, but you can't backtrack one eye. You know, it's not just easy as a flipping a page. You have to really like, you know, it's tough. So, what's after this eye? So, we always do that going back was difficult, but I didn't think that going forward would be difficult. Hafad, anyone? He's nervous. وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزِمُ If you are patient, after hearing all this, 
filthy remarks, this disgusting remarks, this hate, this hate speech. This is hate speech. If you are patient and you fear Allah at that time, don't react outrageously. Don't react and conduct yourself against the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Then these are from the actions of determination. You have to be determined, you have to be resolute, you have to be firm in your, in, in your, in your mindset to continue to, to, to contain your trouble. Okay? Allah said that, look at this, He said, be patient. And how does the Sallallahu Alaihi react to these statements that Mudamman wa Ayyadu Billah? He would say, Ala tarawna, kayfa yasrifu Allahu anni shakna Qurayshin wa la'anamu? Yashtumuna Mudammaman, wa yudamminu umuna Mudammaman, wa ana Muhammadan. Wa ana Muhammadan. He would say to the Sahaba, because he can see the reaction that they're going to be upset, they're going to be angry. Natural human instinct, we can angry when someone hurts our beloved person. So he says, one began to hit him that don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repelled and, and, and has warded off their evil statements against me? Don't you see how he's done it? Looking at the positive, he could have said that, oh, you're making fun of me. Or not my dude, you have to, you know, go to downtown and protest or in a rally. Okay? But he said, looking at the positive situation, there's not much you can do about that. If someone's calling you a name, what are you going to do to that? You can always resort to brute force and hurt the person. Okay? So Rasulullah says, Don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is turning their insult away from me? How do you, how, how do you... What did he say? He says that they are cursing a person called Mudamma. They curse Mudamma. They are saying things about Mudamma. I don't know who that is. Ana Muhammad. Ana Muhammad. There's two ways you can go about the situation. When someone calls you a name and says, takes your name and says it in a funny way, or makes it animal out or whatever he does to it, you can get angry and say, don't call me that. Or you can say, he's ignorant, I don't know what to talk about. He's not talking to me. And unfortunately, all the time, what we do is we're like, he's talking to me? And he'll say, yeah, I'm talking to you. We just make things worse. Okay, a lot of times the guy is usually tougher. Huh? But sometimes not maybe. But the point is, the Sussama is going to angry and upset and depressed. A lot of kids, they go, they go to school, they have beautiful Muslim names. But you have other bullies in school who call them names to make fun of the Sunnah, who make fun of if they're, they're growing a beard in high school, they make fun of them. Yeah, they get all upset. We've been talking, just ignore it. Don't take it to heart. These people don't know why you're growing the beard. They don't know who had the beard and what, who you're following. So Rasulullah so says that they're cursing and, and, and saying ugly things about some guy named Mudamma. I don't know who he is. I'm Muhammad. I'm Muhammad. Again, being optimistic, looking at the positive side of situations. When, when they drew the cartoon of Rasulullah he can people that he even said that. That's not Rasulullah Who's that? No one knows how he looks, how many people him. That's nobody. But we got angry. And when you're angry, you lose control. When you're angry, you lose control. You say things, you do things that you never meant to do. Okay, that's what Rasulullah said. So I'm talking about anger. Remember that. We're talking about anger. Where, where did we come from? We don't know where we came from. We started in Medina. Okay. We started with the stars and stuff, right? And now we're somewhere else. Now, I ask you, what was the last thing you spoke about? Okay, so just keep that in mind, inshallah. So what was the last thing I said right now? Kind of don't work. Difference of opinion. So, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very simply, he could have got angry, but he did not. Okay? So let's go right back to the story of Umar Radhi Allah. Okay? Umar Radhi Allah says that it's Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whenever I say his name, you can say it aloud, but just whisper it, just say what you say, okay? This man has caused a lot of mischief in Mecca. He's destroying our society, you know, our way of life, taking our values away from us. You know, we gotta stand up. Someone's gotta take a stand. Someone's gotta do something about it. So Umar, he's in a situation to do that. He's like six foot five probably, okay, maybe 300 pounds or so. Okay, again, through hadith you can't judge his weight, but I'm just saying, like, so you picture a big guy. 
he has this huge sword in his hand, and he's going, and everyone knows his anger. He gets, he gets angry really fast. He gets angry really fast, okay? And if you look at the seal, you'll find examples that whenever someone would say something, other word of kufr, or try to hurt us, or try to hurt the Muslims, I don't know what I will say. Ya Rasulullah, da'ni ala wala. Ya Rasulullah, let me kill him. Let me kill him. Okay? That this person is a traitor, we don't want anything to do with him. Just get rid of him and take care of him right now. So Umar the Imam takes his sword, he puts it on, and he's going towards that Allah Ta'ala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would normally pray the Salah and he takes the Sahaba in the, the house of Allah Ta'ala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Zidna Allah Ta'ala So, on the way there, the Sahabi, he sees Umar the Imam, he's getting angry. He's also kind of related to Umar the Imam. Where are you going? Look at me kind of today. Where are you going? And, you know, and at that time, you know that anything can happen to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, your, your worst fear is that someone's going to hurt him. So the Sahaba, the Sahabi had a situation, a couple of minutes to react, a couple of seconds actually to react, and he reacted. What do you do? Where are you going? Man, I'm going to go take care of him today. This is enough. I've had enough. Now we have a couple of seconds of, hey, you know you can't. And try to fight him. Because maybe he might kill him, hurt him. Or he said, you know what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Calm down. Relax. You can go take care of Muhammad. Why don't you take care of your own family first? What? My family? Yeah, your sister became Muslim. That's what the word in the street. My sister? Right away. What do we think Omar does now? He's so angry, he can't control. He was going to kill the Muslim of Allah. If he did that, but Ayyad of Allah, he would take care of the whole situation. But now he's angry. What? What? What did you say, my sister? I'm going to go. So he goes to his sister's house. While he's walking towards the house, they weren't like, like solid mansions, you couldn't hear, soundproof. No, it was a, maybe a little house with a curtain on, on the door for the entrance. And he heard, what did he hear? What did he hear? Music? Quran. Quran. Wait, wait, it sounds like the Quran is used to recite all the time. He knocks on the door. Open up, this is Umar. This is just, oh. And at that time, Sayyidina Khalil was like, found him on the Allah Wana. And her husband, Sayyidina Zayd, of the Allah Wana, who is not a quarter of Sahabi, Sayyidina Zayd, of the Allah Wana, is one of the Ashara of Ashara. He's one of the three Sahaba of Rasulullah said that one, one given time, he gave like Ali and these Sahaba are in Jannah. Okay? So Sayyidim Zayd is there, the husband. This is Omar's brother-in-law. And there's a Sahabi in there, Khabbab, who's teaching the Quran. He's their Mu'allim, the tutor. Okay? So, so they quickly hid Khabbab in a closet they had in the house. Maybe a small little curtain they had, and they hid it behind that. And they had a couple of pages of the Quran because the Quran was not compiled at the time. This is the early stage of the Quran. They had a couple of pages on, I think, some type of parchment or leather, and they quickly hid it. Come in. What was you guys just talking about? I heard some, some, some murmuring and some words you were saying. Oh, I'm just talking. No, yeah. no well, there's something here. And he finds that. He finds the page of the Quran. Okay. And he says, You became Muslim? And then he, he hit Sa'id and Zayd and threw him down. And then out of anger, Fatima jumps in to save her husband. Okay, this is clear, not please don't hurt me. Do whatever you can. She goes in and Umar out of anger he hits her and she begins to bleed on her face. Umar is a, he's a human being after all. He's the blood on his sister. He says, okay, I'm sorry. And she says to him, she says, Umar, do whatever you want. Yes, we're Muslim. Go ahead, do whatever you want. Okay. Umar then realizes that okay, she's angry. It's not, not too good. It's my family. What am I doing? And he says, okay, let, let me see. What, what were you saying? Just let me see the paper. So no, you're impure. We can't let you touch this. So then she made him go Muslim, make a kind of wudu and wash himself. And then she handed him the papers of the Quran. And subhanAllah, when he looked at the papers, the, what they were studying was Surah Al-Taha. Surah Al-Taha. Beautiful words, Taha. If you read the Quran, you see, see how beautiful it is. ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى إلا تذكرة لمن يخشى تنزيلا ممن خلق الأرض والسماوات العلى الرحمن على الأرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى وإن تجهر بالقول فإنه يعلم السر وأخفى الله لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء والأسماء Read his eyes and he's just he's just captured by the beautiful rhythm of the Quran it wasn't like normal poetry if you study Arabic language, the more you study the language of Arabic, the more the Quran will become dear to you because you realize how miracle, how, what kind of miracle it is. It's just beautiful, the style of the Quran. Everyone loves to hear the Rahman, the Waqa, because it just sounds amazing. So he is there, he's like, oh, 
right away. Hidayah comes to anyone's heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whom he wishes. Any little thing. Who became the means of his guidance? Maybe the Sahabi who interrupted him. Who intervened. Maybe his anger led up to Islam. Okay? Now, he says, you know what? I have to go. So where does he go now? He goes right back to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's he going there for now? So that's no more of this. That's it. So he's going to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's house, where they were at, Abu Harqam, and some of the Sahaba say, you see, oh, Omar's coming. Oh. Some of the younger Sahaba. He knocks on the door. Who's in the, who's in the house? Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu is there. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi is there. Other Sahaba are there. And Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu anhu is also there. Who was in the Hamza? He was the uncle of Rasulullah Also known for his strength and his, 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 his bravery. Okay. So, he said, Ya Rasulullah, some of the Sahaba were normal human beings. Not all of them were strong and mighty and brave. They were human beings. So one says, Ya Rasulullah, what are we going to do? So Hamza says, Hamza says, let him come. If he has come for good, we will give him good. If he has come seeking evil, we will kill him with his sword. This is Hamza. Hamza again. Hamza and Umar were like, like really, really strong people in Makkah. They were well known for that. Let him come if he wants good, we'll give it to him. If he wants good, we'll kill him with his own sword. Very proud. Tell him. Umar comes in. And some of the narrations that he pushed the young people, some of the smallest half out of the way, he's going to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they're trying to defend Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He grabbed Umar al by the collar, pulled him to him and said, What do you want, Allah? He said, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fearless, fearless. He didn't say, Hamza, take care of him, please. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbed him, insinuation by the collar, insinuation by his waist. And he said, Come, come here, Allah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I come to accept this man. SubhanAllah. So this is Umar al so these people of Sahaba are in the gathering, and he became Muslim after that. Wa Hasan al-Islam, he became a very good Muslim and a strong Muslim. And after that time, up until that time of the Meccan period, the Muslims were performing salah in the house in secret, quietly, you know, not just peacefully. But now Umar brings in, no, what are you bringing the house for? Let's go to the Haram, let's go to the Kaaba. And they had, they had experienced previous incidents where Rasulullah himself, and look at the other Muslims, are praying Salah al the Kaaba and they're being beaten up, tortured, you know, hurt, insulted. So Umar says, that, what, what do we have to fear now? Let's go to the Kaaba. So the narration says that Umar would walk in the front of the gathering and Hamza would walk in the back. And if they have a gathering where Hamza and Umar are there, no one's going to mess with you. <laughs> so that would have Hamza, Islam began to gain strength and we see how it went forth and spread. And the Rasulullah had prophesied. So, we're in that gathering in Medina now. Rasulullah is teaching the Sahaba, and a man comes in. Ya Muhammad, you owe me money. You owe me money. And he's saying harsh words, swearing, cursing, saying all these bad things. The Sahaba are about to go and beat him up. Okay? Rasulullah, what did he say? They say, hey man, I have 10 days left. Get out of here. Did he say, Come on, man, I have 10 days left. Chill, relax. Okay. No, what did he say? He said, Leave him. He said, Let him be. Let him come. Do I, want, do I not owe him money? Did he owe money? I owe him. He has a right upon me. Let him speak. Let him talk about this. Let him, let him say what he wants to say. Let him just go crazy. Let him come in. Then he spoke. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not get angry. And he said, You know what? Go, go give him his money out. And not just now that she owed him, he gave even more than he owed him. This is well known Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That whenever he repays someone's favor, first of all, whenever he took a favor or some type of gift from someone, his, his beautiful habit was to always re repay the gift. Not like right away, like you give a gift, you get a gift exchange, you're not here. It's not like that. Someone give him a gift, and he say, you know what, this person has done good to us. He struck kindness to us. He loved, you know what, let's pay him back. Let's give him money, let's give him a gift. And every time the Prophet ﷺ gave a gift, he always gave something better. And that's what he taught us. He said that when someone 
من أحسن إليكم من صنع إليكم معروفا فكافئوه. When anyone does good to you, pay them back. فإن لم تجدوا ما تكافئوه فاذكروا له. If you have nothing to give them back, you have nothing to repay them back. فاذكروا له. Pray for them. Make dua for them. How much dua? حتى تراه أنت كافأتموه until you feel that you repaid them by dua. So this is the Sunnah of the Sunnah to always repay, to always return a favor for a favor. So that was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very easy blessing. <coughs> so Anas radiallahu anhu was a young Sahabi. He says, Khadamtu al-Nabiya Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ma'ashar sinina. He says, I was in the service of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years. I was there, young, young boy. So, yeah. Oh, Anas, can you go to the market, get this, can you do this, can you do that? Yes, sure, let's go. I was with him for 10 years, a child, maybe 10 or 9 or 11 years old. He says, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi never, never, ever told me. When I didn't do something he asked me to do, hey, why don't you do that? Or for something I did, but I didn't do it correctly, he said, you know, you messed this up. He never spoke to me harshly, he never cursed me. He was always kind to me. And never mind hitting, he never ever hit me. Rasulullah Sallallahu never hit anyone. He never raised a hand on anyone. Except when he kept having to fight against Allah from the jihad and so on and so forth. Even then, the, those who were killed by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were a handful. Anas Ali Allah says that one time I was, Rasulullah sent me to the marketplace to get something for him. And I was walking to the marketplace and I saw my friends playing. They're playing with one of the simple sports they had in there with rocks or something. Okay, and I got, I got caught up with them. And I was telling them, Rasulullah needs me urgently. So naturally, after some time, he came out looking for me. And he says, he found him playing with the kids. He said, he came behind me, he grabbed my ear. Not to didn't twist the ear, and like, maybe it, he just grabbed it, and he said, and us? He says, I'm going, I'm going, I'm So the Sussalah says, this is how we treat the kids. Sometimes when we, when we speak to our kids, and children who are in the masjid, we're always yelling at them. We have no other way to deal with them except by yelling and screaming, and at times, unfortunately, we hit them as well. What does that do? It just makes things worse. Now that child will never respond to you when you speak to him normally. When you say, hey, can you do this? No, I listen. Children have very, very selective hearing. They're hearing only what they want to hear. Okay? If you have little brothers and sisters, you know what I'm talking about. Or children, for that matter. So this is Anas So like I was saying, we, we, we ruin the children's habits. That whenever we seek something from them, we speak in such a harsh tone that whenever we speak like a human being, they never hear us. When they're doing something to out of mischief, the only way to fix it is to hit them now. Whose fault is that? It's your fault, it's our fault. We made them like that. So, an example of how to treat, treat children is in the seerah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Never mind that, adult. There was a Bedouin, a, a, a companion who lived outside of the, of the city. They had their own like secluded lifestyle, their reclusive style, living out, out, in the, in, out in the desert. So they would come into the Medina sometimes to get their needs and to learn from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one time this man came, he wasn't a Muslim, and he came to accept Islam. And the narrations say that after he took his shahada, he made bayat to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I pledge allegiance to you that I will believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not do this, not do that, not do that, etc. etc. He became Muslim. After he's leaving, and he's going back to where he came from, he has to use the bathroom. So right away, in the masjid, in the corner of the masjid, he begins to urinate. In the masjid, he begins to urinate. And it wasn't like nice masjid like this with tiles and, and, and nice rug and stuff. It was just stones and, and dust, and the pillars of the masjid were date palm trunks. The roof were just beams again with dating leaves on top. Okay, very simple message that whenever it would rain, the whole floor would become wet. That's why when we have a hadith that Rasulullah said today it was raining, he said, Still pray in your home, because there was, you couldn't pray in the it was muddy. And we take that excuse now that if it's raining outside, let's pray at home. But you might have to religion. Okay, but you go to the mall, you go to school, you go to your friend's house, you go to a dawah, you go to a party, you go everywhere. Now the message we don't have to go because it's raining outside. Okay, the roads are flooded, the desert are full. Whatever else they can't come to the message. So it's putting in context, anyways. So this, uh, this companion, he's a Bedouin, okay? Very different type of 
lifestyle. Los Osoranzas understood it right away. He seen him. He's in the corner. He's doing any of the masjid. The Sahaba see him in 